And so it begins the new study that we are going to be doing uh, in the book of First Peter. We kind of sort of introduced things last week, although we didn't really dive into the text or anything. We just kind of talked about the book a little bit and talked about the the whole theme of persecution and just some of the other things that we would that we would pick up and that we would uh, that we would see um, as we go through the book. So. Um, now, today in this episode, we're going to get right into it. We're going to start it at verse one of chapter one of First Peter, and I think that we're in for some good things. So I hope you stay with us. My name is Steve Gill, and you're listening to Loving the Scriptures. All right, so this kind of stems back uh, a couple of weeks now because, again, I, I think uh, one thing that I told you um, last week was that the week before, um, when I shared with you the sermon on the restoring work of Jesus, um, it, it was a sermon that featured the uh, um, Peter uh, being restored by the Lord Jesus Christ um, in John chapter 21. Um, I, I want to I say right off the bat that, again, and just as a reminder that when I'm saying that, I'm not talking about being restored to a ministry that 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 Peter was disqualified from because of his denial of the Lord three times. Uh, but I think this was a special work for Peter because Peter was one who, after everything that had happened, kind of maybe had some doubts as far as his usefulness and effectiveness um, for the uh, for the Lord Jesus. Um, and Jesus, in His mercy and His grace, uh, raises Peter up. Um, to show him and to, and to and to tell him that he is going to play a very important role in feeding his, in feeding his sheep. So that's why he said those three times, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, um, you know, that sort of thing. And so I kind of use that as uh, somewhat of a, of a limited introduction to Peter. Like, again, like I said, this was, that wasn't supposed to be a, a full out introduction on Peter the man. And, and we're not going to do that. So we didn't do that so much last week, and we're not going to do that so much this time, although we will talk about Peter um, as it relates to the whole thing of, thing of persecution. Um, you know, the whole introduction of Peter, I'm, I'm afraid what will happen is that we'll, do, we'll break out into a whole study um, of a, a, a very detailed study of Peter that might take a few weeks. And so um, I don't think that that's necessarily necessary. But given the fact that the whole theme of Peter of uh, first first Peter is 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 persecution and and enduring suffering. I think it, it it'll be profitable for us to kind of take a look a little bit um, at what this meant in the life of Peter. You know, just as he was uh, an apostle of Jesus Christ, um, we kind of caught a glimpse of the threat of persecution against him. Um, before Jesus's crucifixion. And of course, again, that goes back to the whole thing of, of Peter denying the Lord three times when people were saying, Hey, weren't you, aren't you part of, uh, with that Jesus fellow? And he, and he said, no, I don't know the man. And he did that three times, just as the Lord Jesus predicted. Um, and then the rooster crowed and then Peter realized what he had done and he went away and he wept bitterly. Um, I think Peter, Peter was one who in a very real and at that time, unprecedented way, um, kind of knew what the heat felt like. Uh, in some sense, he kind of did, and he and the other and the other eleven uh, kind of understood what that was like to a certain degree, but not so much to what you see now, because now what you have is that their Lord um, has been captured by the Jews. All right, they know that that their master is in serious trouble. And so there's nothing, in, at least in their mind, and especially in Peter's mind, to stop them from going after them as well. Why wouldn't they? So, you know, as, as soon as they start pointing out, hey, you are with that Jesus guy, you know, with everything that's going on, Peter understands that, that, that this recognition that's going on and it being pointed out publicly isn't for, isn't for, the, uh, for the purpose of gaining an autograph, okay? Uh, he knows that, uh, that the heat has turned up and that... Um, whatever they're going to do to Jesus, they could easily do to him and some of the other disciples. And so that's where he goes into the denial um, of the Lord three times. Um, and, you know, even after the crucifixion, you see that the, that the, that the disciples are, are locked away in a room. Of course, we know that they're locked away because, you know, again, as it said in John, the door was locked and then Jesus came and appeared to them you know, having come through the locked door, right? So, uh, but the the whole thing being is that they understood that um, with the, what they did to Jesus, they thought that they could, they very well could be next on the list of people to off. And um, so, you know, again, this was something that was, 
in, in many ways, very unprecedented in their minds. Now, after Jesus ascends into heaven, we see that things get turned up even more, except with the coming of the Holy Spirit and the, and the Spirit working in them and speaking through them with power, um, you see that they're in a much better position to endure uh, the suffering that comes upon them in the book of Acts. And so, um, you know, given the fact that, you know, we have Peter here um, who at the very outset of the book of First Peter obviously identifies himself um, much different than how we write letters today. Uh, you know, they put uh, they put their name in the front of the letter. We put ours in the back, but we know exactly who is responsible for writing the writing the letter in first Peter right there in, in verse one, it says Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so an apostle uh, is one is a word that means uh, being sent, sent forth, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, there's a there's a dis, there's a distinction, I think we should say of, of the original um, apostles that we read in the Bible and other apostles today. Um, apostles, you know, th- some people describe it as a apostle with a capital A versus apostle with a lowercase a. Um, and I don't want, I don't want to go into the whole, I don't want to go on a rabbit trail and, you know, talking about all these distinctions and things like that. In a true sense, we're all, uh, if we're, if we're in Christ, we're all sent forth out into the world, um, as disciples, as disciples of Jesus Christ. Um, and so in that sense, we are apostles. Of course, we're not apostles with a big A, but a little A. There were certain things that were true of apostles, um, in the Bible, the original apostles that aren't true of, of, uh, of other, uh, Christians today. Um, I would say that one of the big things of that is that, uh, is that the original apostles were ones who were witnesses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which Peter obviously was. Um, so, you know, Peter identifies himself as, you know, he says, this is who I, this is me writing this letter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, Peter as an apostle, after Jesus has ascended into heaven and connecting everything that we see as far as his suffering, we, you know, we, we see uh, some glimpses of that um, in the book of Acts. Now, if you've been faithfully listening to loving the scriptures for a long time, you may be familiar way, way, way back when we were studying the book of Acts in the earlier chapters um, of the book of Acts, seeing this very thing um, with the apostle Peter, and not just with Peter, um, but with other apostles um, and then eventually other Christians underneath the apostles as well. Um, but, you know, you see in places like in Acts chapter four and Acts chapter five, uh, where they undergo, you know, this persecution. You know, the, the whole thing starts out in Acts chapter three when when Peter and John healed the lame beggar who's outside the temple. Um, and so that that serves as a springboard um, for Peter to uh, to preach the gospel to the onlookers who are in the temple. You have many people who come to know the Lord. But then when it comes to uh, chapter four of Acts, it says, and, and as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But th- but many of these who had had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about five thousand. So there you see the arrest of 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 Peter and John. Really, that's who you're dealing with because Peter and John were together when this whole thing when this whole thing came about. And as things proceed further, I, we don't have to go into great detail here. In fact, if you want to, if you want to. Um, if you want to uh, have a, a, a de- uh, hear a deeper discussion on this, again, we did go through uh, the book of Acts, and this is going to be one of the earlier episodes that we went through, and I should have gotten the episode number, um, but I believe that um, the episode of interest that you would want to listen to, um, well, there's actually two. There's one that's entitled Pre- uh, Preaching the Cornerstone, and I believe the one right after that is called um, The Barrier of Hard-Heartedness. Um, I want to say it's in like um, episodes 17 and 18. I think those w- are what the episodes are. If, you know, if my memory serves me correctly, um, I'll actually be kind of amazed if I get that right. But for a fuller discussion on everything that went down there, you can listen to those two episodes to get a kind of a little bit more of a deeper analysis on everything that was going on. But you see that Peter is in the midst of all of this. And we see a different kind of Peter. We see a different kind of Peter um, that is uh, that seems uh, more bold, uh, doesn't seem to have a lot of fear about him. 
Um, and, uh, you know, and, and in fact, when you look at places like verse, verse 13, you see that people recognize the boldness of Peter. Uh, it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John um, and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. So um, you have Peter here who is very bold. Um, you know, he, the boldness is, is very much manifest and very much on high display in the, in the previous verses, previous to uh, verse 13. Um, but as you read further in that chapter, you read and, and see that uh, eventually what they what the decision that the council comes to is that they are no longer allowed to to preach um in the name of jesus um but as you see there in verse 19 of acts chapter 4 it says but peter and john answered them whether it is right in the sight of god to listen to you rather than to god you must judge for we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard so basically they're not going to be deterred be deterred be deterred in anything that they're doing Okay, the council says one thing, but Peter and John understand that they've been given marching orders from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And so basically they're saying it's not going to be proper for us to not listen to God in order to obey you. And we see that as they continue to go about in their ministry and everything like that, they get in trouble again. They get rearrested, right? And so you see that in chapter five, they get thrown in jail. And then that's when the angel comes and, and opens up the opens up the door. And said and tells them to go and uh, and and preach the way of this new life, and so they go out and they start and they start preaching um, in the temple like like they were supposed to, um, and so you know again they they come up to um, um, in verse uh, in verse uh, this is in Acts chapter five verse twenty seven it says and when they came when they had brought them. They set them before the council and the high priest questioned them saying, we strictly charged you not to teach in the, in this name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you, and you intend to bring this man's blood, this man being Jesus, this man's blood upon us. Uh, but Peter said to the, uh, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. And they, they continue to speak, um, and, and, and everything like that. And so if you read further in the text, we don't have to go deep into this, but again, if you just in summary form, if you go into the text, you, you see that they're, they, they're put out of the room for a little bit. Uh, Gamaliel advises them not to be too harsh on them because what if they are actually from the Lord, then we don't want to be opposing the Lord and everything like that. And so they bring them back in and they give them an order again, not to preach in the name of Jesus. And they had them beaten. They beat them and, and continue to threaten them. Um, and so that's the kind of the first form, the first instance that you see in the book of Acts as persecution is unfolding. That's the first form of physical persecution that you see. But what's noteworthy there, and I do want to read this, um, is the reaction of Peter and the apostles. Again, Peter's not alone here. There's Peter and some of the other apostles and, and um, on the scene as well. Um, after they were... Um, uh, that they were, uh, they beat them. This is middle of uh, verse 40. Um, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Now in verse 41, it says, and they left the presence of the council rejoicing that they had, that they were counted worthy of suffering dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease co teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. So there, and again, there you see it, a, an undeterred spirit with Peter and the other apostles who were suffering through this whole thing. So laying all of that out, we see that we're dealing with a man in the person of Peter. Uh, now, several years later, as he's writing this, this, this epistle uh, of first Peter, um, as somebody who has been through the ringer a few times. And he's actually heard teachings about this as well. So if you remember, even way back before Jesus's arrest and trial and everything like that, um, you know, Peter was was part, was part of the 12 and was following Jesus when Jesus gave his sermon on the mount. And Jesus was one who had said, blessed are you when people persecute you and exclude you and say all kinds of evil things against you because of the son of man. Rejoice and be glad for great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they treated the they treated the prophets. And so, and so what we saw in Acts chapter five, we see Peter putting that into very good use and very good application there. So Peter had been taught from the Lord Jesus Christ himself about suffering and how to react to it. 
Peter has lived through it, uh, both in the potential suffering that he would that he was afraid of uh, during the time of Jesus's arrest, and even a little bit after his crucifixion and his resurrection, and we see it now after the uh, after the ascension of Jesus Christ in the um, in the book of Acts. And even when you see um, what he went through in the book of Acts, you see that he and as well as the other apostles, again, it's not just him, uh, but he and some and the other apostles, how they react to um, to everything that had uh, that had gone on. Even I didn't intend to go down this road, but just for just a, a quick minute here, even after their first form of persecution um, in Acts chapter four, um, when they when they're released and they and they gather together with the other with the other uh, with the other believers um, and tell them everything that happened, they and everybody else, the first thing that they do is they lift up their voices in prayer, um, which I think is a very very great example for a lot of for a lot of us in twenty uh, first uh, century America today because I don't think that that is the that is the first um, course of action that we take whenever persecution or any sort of threat of persecution is upon us. But that's Peter doing, I believe, what he is going to mention later on in First Peter in talking about um, uh, even what Jesus did in entrusting himself to him who judges righteously, him who judges justly. And behind all that, what Peter is saying is that we need to follow Christ's example. And so in all of this, I think that Peter is just following the example of Jesus Christ in all of this thing. And so Peter had a good understanding on how to suffer well. And so if you remember from last time when we're talking about this whole thing and introducing First Peter, the thing that I told you is that I like to look at, I like to think of First Peter as a, um, as a manual on how to suffer well, okay? And it's, and it's unlike any manual that you and I would even really expect, okay, uh, when it comes to things like this. And we'll and we'll point out a lot of the unique the unique nature of of, of this of this manual as we go through this. Um, but um, but all of this is to say is that Peter uh, certainly has a great deal of credibility in writing this manual on how to suffer well. He's heard the teachings of Jesus himself. He's lived through it himself. And he's actually put it to application. And so as somebody who is being used of the Holy Spirit, moved along by the Holy Spirit and inspired by the Holy Spirit to write down what we have here, Peter is going to lay down um, just from divine inspiration and, and personal expertise, you know, this whole thing on, on what it means to suffer well and how we are to suffer well. Okay. So now, remember kind of the setting here. As I mentioned before, this letter was written uh, sometime in the 60s, um, 63, 64, but may actually maybe more, probably more 64 or 65-ish a, um, AD. Um, and so if we're talking about 64 AD, you know, the question is, did this happen before or after uh, the the uh, the Roman persecution that came under the hand of Nero? Um, if you want to know a little bit more about that, listen to the previous episode that we did. Uh, but all of that to say is that in 64 AD, uh, Christians in Rome were going through a uh, very hard persecution under the, under the, under the, uh, under the reign of Emperor Nero. Um, and the, that persecution was limited only to the city of Rome. But I think maybe what possibly may have been happening is that there is a ripple effect of some sort based on everything that's happening in Rome that, that spread out to other areas. Persecution, not in the sense of, of, of the same in the same of the same form that's happening in Rome, um, but in in other in other forms as well. Maybe an uptake of, of suffering that had already been going on in some of these different areas, and and particularly and specifically where uh, where Peter has his eye on and who he's writing to are people in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Those are provinces. Um, but, but those are provinces that are just south of the, of the Black Sea. Okay, so. That's so, so that's really what you have going on there. And so as these believers are going through um, certain forms of persecution, and again, and again, I don't think that we're talking about physical persecution in the sense that they're that they're that a lot of these people are being put to death. It hasn't reached that point yet, but I think there's a lot of ridicule, reviling, exclusion, and all sorts of other things. You'll read about that in chapter four, but it is a form of, of persecution nonetheless that's obviously not comfortable. Any form of persecution is not a comfortable experience, 
Okay. And so Peter is coming with encouraging words and showing these people um, based on the authority of God himself as he's moved along by the Holy Spirit on how to suffer well. Okay, so that's so that's what we have with with Peter. Okay, we've 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 talked a little bit about P, the the author of this of this letter of this manual, Peter, who identifies himself there at the at the very beginning in verse one, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Okay, so he's a sent one from Jesus Christ. Which, you know, if you're given the fact that he's sent from Jesus Christ, that's pre, that's a pretty reliable reliable source of Jesus Christ is the one who's sending him, right? Um, remember, apostle is one who's is one who is sent. Okay, and so that's this is that's how Peter um, identifies himself. Okay, now who is this being written to? I'm going to read I'm going to read the rest of verse one and verse two, um, but we're only probably just going to look at the first verse here. Like I said b- uh, uh, before, we're just going to ease our way into this initially, and then we're going to and then we're going to pick things up uh, more and more as we as we as we as we go further into the, into the book. But um, here, the, let me just start at the beginning here and read the first couple of verses here. It says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect, uh, who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood, Grace, uh, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Okay, so that's that's kind of the the standard the the um well not standard. I mean, it's some of it's a, a standard greeting, but you know, there's certain things in there that are unique to the that particular audience, obviously. But there you have a very simple uh, salutation um, that opens up in this letter. Now, the thing is here, you we're going to look at this, this salutation and the things that are in these first couple of verses, and it's jam-packed with a lot of interesting and important things, okay? So we're going to take a look at that starting in verse 1. We Again, we've already looked at the author of this book, who is Peter, okay? And he's and and we are introduced to who this is written to, and so it says there in, in the rest of verse one to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay, now let's start out as we examine the 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 audience to who this to whom this this manual was written. There are descriptive words here that Paul that excuse me not Paul that Peter uses. That's very relevant to everything else that that Peter is going to be talking about in this manual on how to suffer well. Okay, and I want to I want your your attention to zero in on the on the term as it's as it's uh, as it's stated here in my ESV elect exiles. Okay, now let's start now just taking those two words. You know these are those are very interesting descriptive words. Okay, that P, that Peter uses to describe his audience. And really, those are those are descriptive words that are descriptive of Christians all around. So, understand that Peter is is, is applying these these terms to uh, these people in, in these provinces. But understand that as followers of Jesus Christ, you and I fit the bill as it relates to these descriptive words as well. Okay, and so let's in out of those two words, elect ex- exiles. Let's take the second word first. Okay, let's let's consider what he's talking about with exiles now. It's interesting because here it, 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 the word it, it, in, in the English appears as exiles here in this e, in my ESV. In several of the uh, of other of some of the other um, translations that you that you might read, the word that is used in English that 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 the translators use are words such as sojourner or an alien or a foreigner or or, or that sort of thing, which. From an English perspective, it kind of comes off a little bit differently. The um, uh, the the actual Greek word um, that's used there, kind of uh, it, it that that's used there, has that meaning of sojourner. Okay, and a sojourner, you know, so the word sojourner, even that word is not one is a, isn't a word that's used with frequency in our culture today. But I think a lot of us may have an understanding of what that is. A sojourner being somebody who live who temporarily lives in another land not their own. Okay, or in a country uh, that's not their own. 
Okay. Um, in the Old Testament, in, in the among the people of Israel, even before they took over the land, you you read of certain people who were sojourners, people who weren't Israelites but lived in the land. They they weren't going to be there permanently. They were they were temporary and that sort of thing. Um, they weren't citizens of that of that community of that country of that land. Okay. And so, and really that the, the word sojourner is, is a little bit more closer to what the, what the original Greek word, uh, is, is trying to convey. Um, I, I, I kind of, I'm kind of sort of iffy on the, on the word choice that's used here in my ESV, um, of the term exiles. I think I know as far as translation goes, why that word is used and that word does come, it will appear later alongside the word the word so, sojourners in chapter 2 verse 11 be, beloved i urge you as sojourners and exiles and there you see the uh, uh, the same uh the same greek word for sojourners there in verse 11 but you have another word um um that uh, that covers the other word as well and so you know so i just consider all of that and just think about the word choice here of exiles um, where I think it's a little bit, it means a little bit more about meaning sojourners. A sojourner, again, is somebody who temporarily lives, lives in a land or a country, not their own, pretty much. An exile, we think of exile. An exile is somebody who is barred from their, from their country, from their own land, from their own country, okay? Or they've been driven out of their country. They're exiles. They're no longer in that, in, in that land, um, a lot of times it's for political purses, uh, purposes or, or some other or for some other purpose. A lot of times, like I said, for political reasons. Um, and so you kind of try and play the comparison game between, OK, if, if exiles is really what's being meant here, um, you know, how does that translate to what Peter is trying to talk about to his audience? Because really um, these people who are in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia aren't real actual exiles from their actual land. Um, you know, that sort of thing. And they're not exiles from their true citizenship, which is which is heaven. Um, they're not there in heaven yet, but they're not barred as citizens yet. So it, you know, they're you know, there's there's could be questions that could be that could be made about the word choice that's uh that's that's used that's used there. Um but I think whether you're talking about the word sojourner or whether you're talking about the word exile, the one common denominator I think that you can grab from both words, no matter you know whether it means one or the other, the, the one common thing that you can grab from both of those words is that we're dealing with, some, with, with, with people who are outsiders, okay? People who are outsiders to the people around them. OK, and that's really that's really what what uh, what uh, the sense that Peter is after. OK, is that he's writing to a group of outsiders, maybe on an even more harsher term. Uh, he's dealing he's writing to people who are who are from the general perspective of the world and the world system are outcasts. OK, they are outcasts. So as as people who are who are living in a temporary land. Um, they are they are seen as outsiders and in a lot of cases outcasts of the people around them. So this whole let's use let's let's use the term sojourner in that in the whole concept of people who are temporary living temporarily living in a land not their own. What we're dealing with here is a comparison between recognizing our true citizenship, which is heaven. If you you look at places like Philippians three twenty. And where we are right now, where the fully consummated kingdom hasn't arrived yet. Okay, the kingdom is here in a limited sense, but the fullness of the kingdom and the home and the dwelling place of righteousness hasn't been inaugurated yet. Okay. And so us as citizens of heaven, but and who have not reached the full, the fullness of that. Uh, which will come when Jesus Christ comes back, and we'll, and Peter will get into that a little bit later and talk about that in chapter one. We, for the time being, are people who exist in a world and in a system that is filled with unrighteousness. And as righteous people, not perfectly righteous people in practice, but righteous uh, forensically, and people who have the spirit and who walk in righteousness, People, these pe are these are people who walk in a way that is different than the world system of which they are not a part. Okay, and so 
when you have the abuse that is heaped upon pe- these Christians, as these people in the first century are, are experiencing, one of the things that Peter wants his audience to understand is that they are going through things in a sense, they're going, they're going through these hardships in an, in a land, in a, in a, in an existence that's not their true home. Okay. If you really want to know what the true home is, I would, I would, I would turn your attention to second Peter. Um, and you know, with a lot of things that we can draw from these things here, I could spend so many minutes talking about um, a lot of things that scripture says about these things, but I, I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I don't want to go on and on and on and, and, you know, risk going on rabbit trails and things like that. But in connection to all of this, I think it's important to point out what Peter says in, in second Peter is second is second epistle, second Peter chapter three. And this is after the whole thing about, uh, about uh, Peter talking about the second coming of Christ and everything that happens at that time. Um, when, uh, the heavens will pass away, as he says in, in verse 10 of chapter three, uh, with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works uh, that are done on it will be exposed. Notice not just the, not just the, the earth, but the works that are done in it will be exposed. And again, this is all talking about things that will be revealed when Jesus Christ comes back. Now, in verse 11 and following, what Peter is going to point out here is that how should we respond in light of everything of what we know is going to happen in the future? And so in verse 11, he says, since all these things are thus to be, dis- uh, are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in, uh, in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt and they uh, uh, will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth. Here it is in which righteousness dwells. And that's what we're waiting for. We're waiting for a home where righteousness, total, complete righteousness, where sin and, and, and wickedness and everything is finally judged. And all of that is done away with and the new heavens and the new earth. You can read about that in, in revelations chapter, uh, uh, revelation chapter 21, when all of that comes, that is good. That is going to be a place where, as Peter describes it here, place where righteousness dwells. Okay, fully and perfectly. But again, that's not going to come until Jesus Christ comes back. So in the meantime, what we're what we are doing is we're living in a in a in a land that temper that in temporarily in a land, so to speak, that's not our own. Okay. This isn't our true home. And that's very important for us to understand. If we have the wrong perspective about what our true home is, we are going to be not going to be in a good position to suffer well, as Peter is going to point out, as Peter as Peter is going to lay out here. You know, the, the thing that we have to understand is that as we are living on this earth, on this side of eternity, there is there are trials, there are sufferings that that are to be experienced by the Christian as they live here on this earth. Jesus warned about it. Paul warned about it. Peter is warning about it. Even if you go back, that brings to mind, actually, let me turn here um, to Acts um, chapter, I believe it's chapter 15. Give me a second here. I'm going to pull this up here. Um, In Acts chapter 15, um, I think it's Acts chapter, uh, no, actually, I think it's Acts chapter 14. Um, that I need that I need to look at here. Um, yeah. in um, let me start in verse 21. It says when they had preached the gospel uh, to that city um, and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra uh, and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Okay, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. And I think the kingdom of God in that sense is talking about the fully consummated kingdom when Christ comes back. But until that time, there's there's tribulations to suffer. There's hardships to undergo. And he says that we must go through those things to enter the kingdom of God. 
So in other words, as long as we're here on this side of eternity in a, in, in a, in a land, that's not our true home because we're, 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 our true citizenship is in heaven. The things that Christians go through, whether we're talking about Christians in the first century um, in these different provinces or even here by extension in 21st century America, whatever sort of persecution or trouble or hardship that we face because of our faith is an indication that we have not reached our true home yet. And our, our hope is to one day reach that home. See, one of the things that, that I think that would be very beneficial for all of us is that whatever sort of for, whatever form of hardship and persecution you might be going through, it propels us to think ahead to that which is our true hope. And you know what? Peter is going to get into that as he launches into his letter. Starting in verses three and following, we're going to dig into all of that as well. Okay. But the way Peter addresses things here, he addresses this letter, okay, to people who have not reached their full home yet. They're sojourners, okay? We're foreigners and in in a, in a, in a, we're, we're aliens in a foreign land, okay? And so part of the problem that we see in, in, with Christians today is that they forget this truth and the primary home that they see is, thing, is, 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 is this world. This world, this system, this earth as we know it, the earth before the new heavens and the new hurt and, and the new earth is ushered in. And when things shift and start to become uncomfortable for us as Christians because of the what the world is promoting and what the world says about Christians or what the world threatens what they'll do to Christians if they don't acknowledge A, B, C, or D, or if they don't do A, B, C, or D, there's a little bit more of an adverse reaction to that because they don't have their mind set on where their true home is. And understanding that as in being in this place that is not their true home, they are due to suffer many different things because they are otherworldly. Okay. And that's the thing. We look so different from the true natives of this land that as we walk in righteousness, it's going to invite, listen, it's going to invite, it's going to invite persecution and hardship because as citizens of another world, we have a different culture. People of this world have their own culture, a culture that they're very comfortable with. And as when we bring our culture into their culture, they get uncomfortable with it because it exposes their unrighteousness. As people who are going to dwell in a home of righteousness, we are to live in righteousness now in preparation for the home that we're going to have ahead. And as we do that, it exposes the darkness that's in other people's lives. Now, for some people that might bring about conviction that leads them to the Lord Jesus Christ. But in many cases, many cases, it doesn't work that way. And people resist, people revile, people attack and that sort of thing. That's the life. That's the things that we see as people who are living in a world that's not our own. We are the we're the weird ones coming into into a system that is that is set in their ways, okay? And so we have to understand that we have to realize that. But at the same time, let us also have hope in the home of righteousness, a place where righteousness dwells. Let us have our hope set on that, understanding all of the things that we're going to have in Christ when He comes back. And again, Peter's going to talk about that. Don't want to go into that now, but we're gonna we're gonna cover that sort of stuff later, okay? We're gonna cover that later. But that's the but that's the significance of the word that Peter uses here of sojourners or exiles as it's as it's used here in uh, in my in my ESV here. But again, notice the, again the two words that we, that were said there were they were elect exiles, elect exiles. They're chosen exiles. Now here's where we, where pe- things get a little bit shaky for some people. Because that brings that uh, brings about the whole thing of election and predestination and that sort of thing. I do believe in election. I do believe in predestination. I do believe that the Bible lays that out. I don't have time to go through go into a whole argumentation on why I believe that. Again, I would refer you to other episodes where this sort of thing has been covered, and I believe those episodes are episodes fifty five and fifty six. I spent two weeks on that. This was in the midst of our study of the Book of Acts, and it covered uh, chapter thirteen, verse forty eight. And it didn't just cover uh, the, that verse, but it, it kind of expanded and talked about election in general. 
and what the Bible has to say about that. So if you're curious about my analysis on that and what the Bible says about that, I would refer you to those two episodes um, as well. But let's just, you know, I, I really hope, friends, that you embrace with all of your heart this this whole notion that 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 you are chosen of God, okay? And it's not because of anything that we've done. That's part of the whole grace thing. You know, God chose you because he chose you. I mean, if you want to put it very simply, that's that's what he did. It wasn't because of he knew of the choice that you would make or something like that. Again, I talk about that in the in the episodes that I just mentioned to you before. It's all according to his grace, uh, according to his grace that he showered upon us. He selected us. And so that that whole notion in in the minds of Peter's audience and hopefully to us as well, but especially to Peter's original audience who are going through consistently and on a continual basis, this whole this whole thing of suffering and persecution. The fact that they would that they would see themselves as elect, as, as that Peter would say that you guys are elect exiles, would be very significant for them. In the sense that, look, the world may reject you, but God never, re- not God doesn't reject you. In fact, He chose you out of the world. If you want to know how special you are in, in Christ, consider the fact that He chose you. Not by anything that you had done, not because you you were worthy of it, not because you were deserving of it, not because you were you were well behaved, um, not because you had any sort of positive thing going about you. In fact, you had several demerits in your in your account. But listen, you don't have to worry about the world and what they think about you when you understand that God is the one who chose you out of the world. And what's more important? What's more significant, the fact that the God of the universe chose you for salvation in Jesus Christ or being loved and accepted by the world that hates Christ in the first place? See what I'm saying? The mere fact that we are chosen and elect of God says something very significant. If we're chosen and, 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 and selected by God, we know that God has our back. Okay. He has our back. And that nobody can truly be against us. I mean, that goes back to the whole things of, of things that Paul says in Romans chapter eight. If God is for us, who can be against us? Who can condemn us? It's God who justifies, right? So the fact that we're chosen, chosen in him, speaks a very powerful word to groups of people who are going, undergoing intense persecution. Okay. And, it's, and it can speak to us as well in whatever form of, of harassment, hassle, or persecution that you might go through, or maybe are going through right now, who knows, right? You are chosen of God. You are in his hands. And therefore, that is, that is what's most significant. The world might reject you, but God's got your back because he chose you out of the world. In fact, it's that, cho- it's, it's, it's that choosing it really causes a lot of the problems in the first place. Now, that's not to say that God did anything wrong, obviously, but again, that just shows shows you the heart of man. If you were to look at places like um, John chapter 15 and in verse uh, verse 18, um, it says, is that verse 18? Yeah, verse 18 of John chapter 15. This is Jesus talking to his disciples in the upper room. He says that the world hates you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you are of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore the world hates you. Now I want to, I want to make clear that what Jesus isn't saying there, he's not saying that, um, that the world hates you because I chose you out of the world. And because I choose you, chose you out of the world, they're jealous because they want to be chosen as well. That's not what we're talking about. Basically what we're talking about is that Jesus chose them out of the world, chose them to, to a different life, to a different reality. If you look in, even in, even in the context of Jesus's words in the upper room, he talks about them bearing fruit and fruit that will last and all those sorts of things. Again, that creates a whole thing of otherworldliness that is different from the eyes of people of the world. 
Because as Jesus says there in that passage, if you are of the world, the world would love you as its own. But now you're different. You're, you're, you're a complete anomaly to the, in, in the minds of people of the world, right? It really fits in well with what Peter said, will, what Peter will say later in first Peter chapter four, where it says that these are the things that, that the pagans do, but, but you don't do those, those things any longer. They think it's strange that you don't join them in the flood of dissipation and they heap abuse on you. They recognize the differences. They know that you're, that you're a weird alien in their midst and that in their eyes, in their eyes, in their mind, in their thinking, you're not normal. Okay. Now, again, I, I want to, I want to make clear that we're talking about this in, in, in a general sense, the world system and how it generally thinks and how the church generally lives and generally thinks and generally follows in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. I understand that many Christians have very nice and very kind non-Christian friends, people who know that they're Christians and they still treat them with respect and things like that. I understand that. I'm not saying that every single person in the world is going to treat you badly. That's not what I'm saying. But again, we're looking at this from a general viewpoint, okay? I mean, just think about the things that, that Christianity promotes because it's bi- biblical. And if we were just to shout those, all of those things from the rooftop, you will have many people. It's not going to take you long. Within seconds, you're going to have many people who are, kind of, who are going to shout you down and vilify you and hate you. Okay, not going to take long. So we have to understand. We have, we have to understand that. I want to I want to clear that up as well. But Jesus says, because I chose you out of the world and into this otherworldly sort of existence, the world hates you. Okay. And listen, it hates you. It hates them because as they are chosen out of the world, they're chosen out of the world. And in the, again, in the context of that upper room discourse, they're going to be people who bear fruit, which means they're going to be people who are going to look more like Christ. And remember what Jesus said in that passage. He says, if they hate you, understand that they hated me first. So why do they hate you? They hate you because you look like Christ. They hate Christ. You look like Christ. Therefore, they hate you. True. And so there's a cost. Listen, there's a cost to living and walking as Jesus walked. That goes back to what Paul said in second in second Timothy three. We mentioned that uh, we mentioned this last week where it says that anybody who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus will will the certainty there will be persecuted. All right. That's just the reality. Okay. So those are the descriptive words that Peter uses there for, for his audience. He says, this is written to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Now that's a very interesting term there. The dispersion may, you know, a lot of times we think about the, the term dispersion, uh, dispersion, a lot of times, if this is kind of the technical term that, that Peter is referring to, um, was really a, a term that was, uh, that was to describe Jews who were living in lands outside of the land of Israel. In fact, when you, when you look at the, uh, um, when you understand uh, the, the makeup of the people and the crowd um, on the day of Pentecost, when Peter preached a sermon, he preached to people who were of the dispersion. Those were people who were ethnic Jews, but who came from so many different places. Okay. And so he was in a, in a real sense, he was speaking to the dispersion people who were dispersed, scattered all throughout uh, these different areas. And, and, the, and the point being in that sense is that they, these were Jews who were outside of the homeland, okay? Um, a lot of those people were descendants of people who had lived in those other areas as a result of being scattered. You know, there's different reasons why people, you know, are, are where, they, where they were. They had originally gone into exile um, back in 586 B.C., and then, of course, under uh, the reign of King Cyrus, after 70 years, uh, they, they've been allowed to come back. And some people did come back, but not everybody came back. So you have these people who are dispersed and they are outside of their original homeland, the land of Israel. And so that's what that's what a, a lot of times what's referred to as in, in the dispersion. Peter takes that term and applies it to these people that he's talking to, which you know, by now we're, what we're talking about, we're talking about mostly Gentile people. These are people who predominantly by and large are Gentile Christians, 
But yet he's using this term of dispersion to describe who they are. And the whole thing of the, you know, if we're looking at the dispersion, you know, the, the original technical term of that is it related to the connection with the Jews being people who are scattered away and outside of their original homeland. This again is something that describes the fact that Christians, both these people in the, in the, in the first century that Peter is writing to and to us by extension are people who are outside of our, our, our native homeland, which again goes back to this whole thing of the fact that we are not of this world. We are, we are citizens of heaven. Okay. We live in this world, but we're not of this world. We're citizens of another land. Okay. And there are many of us. I'm here in Nebraska. I have family and friends in Kansas. We have people in all 50 States where Christians are scattered there. And listen, as we know, Christianity is not something that's, that's limited only to the United States. You have Christians all over the world. We're scattered all over the place. But again, if we're talking spiritually here, what we're talking about is our things from an eternal, from an eternal plane. We are not, we are, we are living in a different land in the sense that we are, we have not reached the full home of righteousness, the new heavens and the new earth, which again is going to come when Christ comes back until that time, we are like aliens in a foreign land and we're all, and we're scattered all over the place. We are outside of our, we're, we're outside of our native land. We're outside of our native home. We're aliens. We're strangers. We're just passing through. And I want you to remember, ladies and gentlemen, that this description implies the, the fact that this is all temporary. Whatever you're going through, whatever the church is going through, no matter where you are, no matter what the church is going through, we have to understand that what we're going through right now, whatever it might be, is temporary. And as Peter is going to talk about it, is setting our hope fully on the grace that that's going to be revealed. You know, that goes into other things that that people like Paul talk about in Second Corinthians chapter four, keeping our eyes on the on the unseen rather than the seen, because the seen is transient, but the unseen is eternal. Where is our focus going to be? Where do we choose to put our focus? Where we choose to put our focus is going to have a tremendous effect on how we uh, are uh, whether or not we're able to suffer well. Okay, and again, that's something that Peter's that Peter is going to go into. But he identifies these people as people of the dispersion. Okay, a, 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 a term that's that's used um, that was used to describe Jews who were outside of their native land, but he applies it here in a spiritual sense as it relates to eternal home versus versus an earthly home. Here, okay. So he says to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. And here's where these people live that Paul is, excuse me, not Paul, Peter is writing to in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Okay. Now three of those places, now basically, basically what you have, these are provinces that kind of line up, you know, line up in areas just south of the, uh, just out south of the Black Sea. Okay. If you, if you are uh, familiar with, uh, or you remember um, our study of the book of Acts and particularly in places like Acts chapter 16, some of these places are mentioned. Even in Pentecost, we see that, uh, that, uh, that some of these places are mentioned. Okay. So you have um, Pontus, Cappadocia, and Asia, people from those areas. Again, these were ethnic Jews. Okay who were in Jerusalem at the time of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, you had these people who heard uh, Peter preaching. So Peter's one who preached to people from these areas. Now at that, at this time they were, again, like I said, ethnic Jews, and you had many of these people, them, as well as people from, all, uh, from so many other different areas. You read about that in chapter two, who come to know the Lord. There are 3000 people who came to know the Lord that day. Okay. Now you get into places as you go on, go on in acts, you get to acts chapter eight, Stephen is stoned. A great persecution goes out. And all those people who had been, who had uh, come to know Christ, the 3,000 plus, because the church was growing during that intervening time, scatter, okay? And I don't have any doubt that there are many of those people who eventually, maybe not right away, but eventually made their way back to where they came from, to the provinces that they came from, shared their faith, and then people came to know the Lord there. And then, uh, and then a, a, a lot of the people who started becoming converts in these areas were Gentiles. And so the sense that you get here, as you read through first Peter, is that many of the people that Peter, uh, Peter's talking to, um, are, are Gentiles. 
the former vices that that Peter mentions here are very pagan in nature, which would which would uh, which would indicate a Gentile audience. But the the point being, though, is that you had people you you probably had Christianity spread to these to these different areas, and that Christianity started to grow and started to spread. Now, here's one thing: here when you, when you go to places like Acts chapter sixteen, okay, um, Acts chapter sixteen, it talks about Paul and Silas and Timothy who are going, who are, who are traveling about. This is during Paul's second missionary journey. And it mentions how they try and go to Asia and the Holy Spirit prevents them from going to Asia. Okay. Remember that's one of the places that Peter writes uh, is writing to here, the province of Asia, not the continent, right? Obviously it says they tried to go to Bithynia, which is up North. And it says the spirit of Jesus prevented them from going there as well. Okay, so they just keep on going. They keep making a, a, a straight course, um, a straight course west until they hit the Aegean Sea, and then they have a vision uh, that you know pretty much tells them to go to Macedonia. So okay, but the point being that the Holy Spirit didn't let them go to Asia or to Bithynia, and and then the text I believe says that their purpose of them wanting to go to those areas was to speak the word of God. Now we're not given any reasons as to why. They're prevented from going into there. One possibility, and I, and I stress the word possibility because, again, we don't know for sure. This is just a, a speculation. But maybe one of the reasons is that is that God already had people, nameless, faceless people who are already doing work in some of those areas. Okay. And God had other work for God had other work for for Paul and, and Silas and Timothy to do in other areas that were not touched yet. Same thing of, of, of about places in uh, in Bithynia. Very well may have been that work was already being done there and Christianity was growing and spreading in, in, in some of those different areas. So you have Asia mentioned there, right? And you had, again, uh, people, uh, there were people from Asia that were, that were there um, uh, at Pentecost uh, who may have gone back to Asia after the scattering of the Christians and spread the faith there, right? You have, uh, so, you know, so again, those those are the areas. These, again, these are these are these are provinces that Peter is writing to. These aren't cities; these are provinces, and you have different cities within these provinces. Like with Asia, you know, the one city in Asia that probably many of us are very familiar with because of the book that's in the New Testament and other mentions of it is is Ephesus. Ephesus is in, is um is in Asia, right? Um, you know, and Galatia. Many of us are familiar with Galatia because of the book of Galatians, right? Um, and again, like you know, Galatia Galatia isn't a isn't a isn't a city. It's a it's a province. It's an area where different cities and different churches within that area. So again, I think I may have mentioned this before a while back. Um, is that uh, when when Paul is writing to Galatians, he said, "Notice it says to the churches in Galatians." Um, so he was writing to several churches within that within that area within that province of Galatia. Now, just as a, just as an interesting thing, you can you can give people a trick question here, because if you were to ask somebody how many New Testament books were written to the Galatians, a lot of people will say just one just one letter, and they'll because they'll obviously think Galatians. When technically, technically there are two. You know, granted, First Peter wasn't meant only for the Galatians, but the Galatian Christians were recipients of, of, of the of the Epistle of First Peter. So technically, you could say that two New Testament books were written to the Galatians: the Book of Galatians and also First Peter. Right? But anyway, that's just that's just if you want to play a, a very weird game with people as far as Bible trivia and stuff. But um, but so you see just kind of uh, what we're dealing with here. Um, the, the, you have some of these places and some of these areas and who knows, maybe all of these people, um, uh, maybe all of these areas had people who, uh, representatives who were there at Pentecost and heard Peter preach. And then they were part of that whole thing of spreading the gospel to those different areas. And he had people who were coming to know the Lord. Um, and so you had churches and, and, and converts just growing and expanding in those areas. Now, obviously, when we're talking about this, we're not we're obviously not talking about a total 100 percent conversion of the whole area. Otherwise, if that were the case, there wouldn't be persecution. There wouldn't be opposition. So 
I think the thing is, is that as you have, as you have, uh, you know, things growing in things, you also have opposition that comes from the other side as well. Again, people whose backgrounds are pagan in nature, okay, and they heap abuse on these people who are living their Christian lives, the churches that are existing in those areas, okay? And so that's, that's kind of what you're dealing with. So we've looked at the author here who is Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. And we've looked at these, uh, the, the recipients of this letter, these, these, uh, these, uh, these um, uh, chosen outcasts or these chosen outsiders, whatever you want to, however you want to term it. And so I hope that we've I've done an effective job of, of really just talking about these things and just kind of opening up a little bit more, just kind of who we're dealing with in this whole thing with this manual, who who's going to be receiving this whole thing. Now, the description of these of these recipients isn't isn't finished yet. We're, that's what we're going to get uh, talk about a little bit further when we go into, ch- uh, excuse me, not chapter two, verse two and extract all of those things there, because there's a lot of good stuff there just in that verse alone. And again, a lot of these things are going to is going to point forward to because kind of the themes that Peter is going to unfold um, as uh, as he as he as he goes forth in this in this letter and in this manual on how to suffer well. Okay, so we're still we're still exploring that area of who we're dealing with, who are the recipients of this of this letter, and we're going to go into the description of of these people that's described in a more spiritual sense. What we've looked at here. Um, well, I guess we kind of looked at a spiritual sense in the fact that they are elect exiles, but I mean, more beyond just the fact of where they live geographically, we're going to talk about more about things of who they are spiritually, okay, and what they've been called to, all right? And so those are going to be very important things that we're going to want to spend some time on and explore as we delve into this next time. But for now, we're going to leave it there, okay? And I hope that this was all very uh, helpful and profitable for you and hope it whets your appetite uh, for things that we're going to look at further on down the road. Um, um, if you enjoy this show and if you haven't done so already, um, I would ask that you would subscribe to my show on Apple podcasts. You can also access loving the scriptures on Google play. Um, uh, you can also follow loving the scriptures on Twitter. The handle is at LT scripts. That's L T S E R I P T S, which stands for loving the scriptures. All right, friends. I enjoyed my time with you as I always do. Um, my name is Steve Gill and I will see you right back here next time. Bye now.